Good morning. Um, I will start. Nee, ich werde auf Deutsch anfangen. Guten Morgen. Ähm, äh, sehr schön, dass wieder einige da sind. Ich freue mich sehr, heute Sie zu den Weiterführungen unserer äh, Symposium, digitales Symposium Zukunft, Kunst, Wert und Wirkung nachhaltiger Kunst und Kultur. Und äh, ich spreche erstmal Deutsch für die technische Einführung. Äh, Sie können sich nach dem Gespräch entweder mit der Chat-Funktion an der äh, Diskussion beteiligen oder Sie können gerne, und das würde mich, ich habe das schon letztes, so gestern gesagt, sehr freuen, wenn jemand von Ihnen sich auch traut, uns per Video äh, anzufragen und tatsächlich als Gesicht einzusteigen. Das wäre sehr nett. Okay, now I'm switching to, to English, sorry. <laughs> um, a very welcome to Lucy Latham from London, from Julie's Bicycle. Uh, thank you very much for being with us today. Um, as I think I will make a short introduction about the organization you work for, because I think you are really one of the leading company. I have the impression as a consultant uh, throughout Europe right now. Um, for those who don't know uh, what Judy's Bicycle does, um, it's an organization based in London uh, and has three main working fields. Um, one is, as I already said, Cons consultancy on an environmental uh, question, creative, creative green services, which is consultancy environmental reporting and certification. Another field is creative program, uh, which means work in policy and international projects, which I think it's the focus, uh, it's your focus, Lucy, if I'm correct. And the third one is what we are all looking forward to doing in the future is transformation, which means how to transform our work into environmental sustainability. And maybe not only environmental, this is also a question that we can deal with. So uh, this is a search introduction about the organization Julie's Bicycle. And then I, as I said, I'm very happy that Lucy Latham is with us today. She works um, with key cultural actors in the UK and internationally. And um, she works on strategic in integration of environmental and climate action with the cultural economy. Uh, and what is very interesting to us, I think, today is um, that you Lead, you, lead on, you lead on delivery of Julie's Bicycles partnership with the Art Council England, um, which is something that is really interesting because you are going to talk more on this um, work you do with the Art Council, which is just England, it's not Britain. Am I right? That's correct, yeah. Right, which means, just for understanding, there are different Art Council among Great Britain for each Yes. Season? Okay. Yes, okay. and, and there are similar initiatives as well. Creative Carbon Scotland, for example, is doing something similar um, in right. Scotland. Right, okay. And so, and now you're going to stop talking myself and I'm go you're going to talk about mobilizing art and culture for the green transformation. So the stage is yours and uh, I will ask you question afterward and I hope that our uh, participants are going to ask a lot of questions after your talk. So here we go. Thank you, Valentina. Thank you very much for that introduction. Um, I hope everybody can hear me and see me okay. Uh, I've just had the good luck of a uh, garbage truck coming uh, right outside my house, which is the uh, some of the fun of uh, digital. But um, uh, so my name is Lucy Latham. Um, as Valentina said, I work for Julie's Bicycle. And uh, my role is Arts Council England and Policy Programmes Lead. And today I'm going to talk to you about the uh, transformative power of arts and culture and demonstrate why they must sit at the heart of the environmental movement um, and your agenda. Um, so first I'd like to just take a second to introduce Julie's Bicycle. So we were founded in 2007 
and Julie's Bicycle is working globally across the creative sector to reduce environmental impacts and catalyze a new creative ecology, meaning a cultural sector with environmental values and principles at its heart, from the governance and strategy to the management of cultural buildings, events, and creative and artistic practice. So working with over 2,000 organizations, NGOs, and governments worldwide, Julie's Bicycle has developed an approach which harnesses the power of the creative sector to communicate the reality of the climate crisis. And we advocate for a science-based solutions approach teamed with practical action, offering support and advice to those who share uh, this vision for culture-led social transformation. So firstly, uh, why ACT? I don't think I need to make this point um, hopefully too much anymore because the consequences of climate change are being already felt and are so visible now. Global heating, extreme weather events, involuntary migration, conflict, these are all, um, these are all being felt now and we will continue uh, to see it uh, becoming more and more extreme over time. And according to meteorologists, 2020 is already on course to be the hottest year since records began. So the climate crisis um, is one part of the equation, but it's also twinned with another crisis in biodiversity. And the 2019 United Nations Biodiversity Report states that at least a million species are at risk of extinction because of human action. So in short, the continuation of unchecked global growth based on fossil fuel consumption threatens all aspects of life as we know it. So, you know, this is the issue to, uh, to be uh, coming together and acting ambitiously on. It is about the future survival of our species. So across the world, the effects of climate change and the destruction of nature are generating a call to action. In 2018, um, the publication of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, otherwise known as the IPCC, their special report called for unprecedented changes within the next 12 years in order to keep global warming to a maximum of 1.5 degrees. So these twin challenges, climate and ecology, will not be solved by individual action alone. They are systemic issues and they require systemic solutions. A radical shift in consumption and a clear and unwavering commitment to decarbonize the global economy. So quite the challenge. So what then is the role of arts and culture? Well, whether through uh, craft, fashion, art, music, film, culture is a powerful driver of lifestyles and identities. It is the epicenter of how we think, feel, behave and act. The, its capacity for imagination and innovation enable cultural actors to create compelling and complex stories, engaging emotion as well as intellect, and to reflect, interpret and critique our social and cultural values. Because climate change is ultimately the result of a set of values which are incommensurate with the finite resources of planet Earth. So this is a question of cultural values. And the cultural community is not only rising to the current challenges, but are the trailblazers, creating work that tells a story that neither scientists nor politicians can or will. Uh, we're seeing cross-discipline collaborations, uh, yielding smart ideas, technological innovations, and productive economic alternatives. This community of creative leaders are helping to reconfigure the definition of good governance so that sustainability in all its forms needs no explanation or justification. So the creative community must be recognized as critical to this conversation and as an essential repository for solutions. 
And we believe our partnership with Arts Council England is uh, doing just that, demonstrating the cultural community as an essential repository for environmental solutions. And it also demonstrates the power of cultural policy to affect real change. So to introduce uh, the partnership between Arts Council England and uh, Julie's Bicycle, um, it was our first major support programme working in partnership with Arts Council and it materialised partly as a response to work in cities. So this is where there's a nice connection with what Dresden is doing because actually there's a backstory here that connects to the City of London. So Julie's Bicycle, along with several other organisations, were commissioned by the London Mayor's Culture Office uh, to produce a series of green guides for the creative industries, outlining how they can meet London's ambitious energy emissions reduction target of 60% by 2025. And it was these guides that created the templates for sector action and inspired Arts Council England to embed this thinking within their wider national approach. And the programme swiftly expanded into a cross art form movement. And in 2012, two years later, Arts Council England made it a funding requirement for all their national portfolio organisations and major museums partnerships to report on their environmental impacts and to have an environmental policy and action plan in place. These were the funding requirements. And the program really works to embed environmental sustainability in decision making across the board, from senior management to devolved environmental responsibilities, permeating all job levels. And since 2012, this partnership has tracked um, we uh, do annual data collection. The da data is the sort of crux of the whole program. So we've been able to track an annual 4.5% reduction in energy use, and that's equivalent to over 10 million pounds in energy savings. So not only are we prompting environmental resilience and action on climate, we're also improving sector resilience through reduced financial expenditure. And the number of organizations uh, the carbon literacy is also growing over time. So we're able to demonstrate that the number of organisations reporting robust data has increased by 33% since 2012. So this shows an increase in understanding of environmental impacts and a growing confidence in measuring and managing them. And two aspects that this programme is really reliant on and what I want to sort of put a spotlight on right now. And the first is data. This project is rooted in data to understand impacts, to understand change, evaluate what is working and what needs adapting, to tell the story of sector transformation, uh, to understand changing opinions. We do attitudinal analysis too, to gather ideas and to build the business case for further action. So this programme is underpinned by robust, relevant and accountable research, quantitative data, i.e. the environmental impacts and qualitative data, the attitudes across the sector. And it's through this analysis that we can prove that we are effectively spending public money and that it is actually uh, uh, demonstrating the changes that we set out to achieve. And we can use this information to, to say, to tell stories and to uh, share and communicate the successes. Um, for example, um, or, or, or statistics really that show how much the impact, you know, how much impact the sector has and what the task at hand is. So we can say that the amount of water used could produce cotton for 2.7 million T-shirts or that the sector uses the equivalent energy to power over 120,000 UK households. So this is all really important in terms of building the business case, supporting and strengthening our program and our relationship with the sector. And proving it works, evidencing the savings, demonstrating benefits have enabled us to extend that ambition further. And we've developed in 2018 two new focused programs, uh, Spotlight and Accelerator, and a 
particular thematic stream on social justice. So the Accelerator project is a leadership development and incubate, incubation project combining personal leaderships, uh, knowledge in climate science and social justice uh, with a view to developing a new project or model that will, that will continue uh, to contribute to the vision of a future proof sector. And Spotlight is focused on energy management. So Spotlight supports 30 of the Arts Council England organisations to set science based targets in line with the Paris Agreement and develop carbon reduction strategies through our energy management tools and knowledge sharing communities. And then we were also um, able to build this new stream on social justice. Um, so common grounds, I really wanted to mention common grounds. Um, this thematic strand has created the space to explore the connections between climate breakdown, inequality and social justice and the role the cultural sector can play in recognising and redressing these imbalances. And you can find more information and the recordings from a recent conference uh, called Common Ground on our website. And the second key aspect I wanted to mention um, is support. So in order to support this policy measure, Julie's Bicycle has uh, developed a, a rich program of events, uh, webinars, resources to facilitate the exchange of environmental best practice and, prom and promote um, a community working together towards a common goal and uh, creating this space for dialogue, for skills and practice sharing, for networking, building of confidence, emotional support as well. This remains a really critical function across all of our programmes. So uh, what the Arts Council England programme has also done in a kind of uh, a nice cascading, um, cascading relationship is that a policy intervention on cultural fund 11 cultural funder level has prompted policies on cultural organization level. So we're seeing all kinds of organization um, uh, changes and that's what I want to focus on um, now as I have been asked to give some more practical insights for cultural organizations who are looking to embed sustainability. And um, there's way too much to say for a short speech, but I am going to introduce some key principles of good environmental governance. And good governance helps ensure environmental sustainability is accounted for across decision making um, and that you have the support structures in place to achieve your environmental ambitions. So what are the principles of good governance for organisations? Well, firstly, that sustainability is led by the board and senior management with devolved environmental responsibilities across all areas and different job levels. So that might mean in practice that your management team is literate in topics related to environmental sustainability, that they are prepared to speak publicly and advocate for environmental commitments within the organisation that there are clear roles and responsibilities um, outlining what needs to be achieved, how and at what stage of planning. There may be a green team or a green champion um, that helps um, drive the environmental uh, programme in the organisation and ensuring that uh, environmental literacy training is available for staff members. So that's one. The second is integrated, environmental sustainability is integrated into vision, mission and values. It's values coming up again. So what does this look like in practice? Well, it might mean having an environmental policy or a manifesto. Uh, policy is a bit of a dry term for some, um, understandably. So maybe a manifesto or a formalised or um, a formalised commitment, which is publicly available to environmental sustainability. And that demonstrates that there is a public recognition of arts and culture as a custodian of the natural environment with a responsibility towards inspiring um, environmental and social change. 
and they, these, these, this vision and mission and the values explicitly reflect commitment to environmental sustainability, which then can feed into business planning, fundraising and other strategic documents. But it's about creating the hierarchy of different, uh, different strategic messaging and documents that will allow um, the smaller and the, the, the smaller actions to, um, to get underway. Uh, point three is about legislation and regulations. So again, um, there's going to be um, some of these which are more relevant to some people than others. But I think a critical thing is that you have um, you, you sort of understand the relevance of policy and regulation in your context. Um, that might be city environmental policies and targets, for example, and how they link to and can be translated to cultural uh, practices, uh, for example, on, on emissions reductions or citizen engagement. So you can use city targets to help anchor and channel your programs as well. And then there's something also, I think, important about commitment to compliance or policy or good practice that can be really demonstrated by public disclosure and uh, public disclosure reports, for example. So number four is underpinned by policy, strategy and planning. So you have your uh, values and your mission, and that's that creates the framework for these more practical documents. So you want your environmental policy to be accessible internally and externally. You want your policy reflecting the role of arts and culture aligned with your organizational mission, vision and business plan and a strategy that will actually deliver what your policy and your commitments are saying. And also don't forget your communications strategy. So this is a really uh, important aspect in terms of engaging stakeholders and your environmental aims and objectives. Um, always make sure that you have a comms member of staff in your green team uh, is a very good tip. Uh, number five is clearly disclosed environmental impacts and performance um, over time so that you have measurable environmental targets with associated improvement strategies. So this is about having um, data structures in place, data management, that you develop measures and key performance indicators which are appropriate and meaningful, and that you know that data can be collected and checked for accuracy. And that collected data aims to um, evaluate um, your progress, uh, helps you to consider successes and challenges and transferable learnings in order to improve your uh, practices over time. Number six is embedded in core activities. So you want environmental sustainability to be diffuse across all aspects of your organization, not as an add on just over here. Um, for example, the responsibility of your building manager or your energy or your waste manager. It has to be across the board. So that means commissioning, producing, programming, learning and outreach. Um, all different themes are embedded um, in these areas uh, that will help um, empower all members of your organization. It will help uh, cross fertilization of ideas and more creative ideas and the development of practical um, uh, solutions, for example, to sustainable produ production or sustainable events management. So it's not just about your hardcore impact, energy, waste and water. You could be thinking about biodiversity, food and your catering, um, materials, production. And lastly, um, is number seven, supported by targeted resources. So yes, that might mean money and time. We always want more money and time, that's a given. But there are other resources as well that you can think about. So um, do you have the appropriate environmental understanding? Is there a need for more training? Is there, an, is there a need for um, a new uh, member of staff um, or a specific role that is created to help? Um, in managing your sustainability. Um, 
you may also want to think about in terms of uh, financial resources, creating your own internal fund for environmental initiatives. So we call this um, return on investment, where you can um, ring fence um, money that's made through um, energy or environmental uh, efficiency savings and keep that in a fund to help um, invest in further environmental activities. So um, I am aware I've been speaking for quite a while. Um, I do have some recommendations, but they might come out in the discussion. So I'll just put those on pause um, for now. They're kind of they're, they're a summary of what I've already said, but we'll just see how we're doing for time, because I do want to finish um, speaking to this context that we're all in right now, um, a health global health pandemic. Uh, we are in very difficult times. Um, increasingly, parallels are being drawn between COVID-19 and the climate and ecological crisis, um, which is helping us think about what we can take from this moment in time to better prepare um, for a future of um, challenge, which undoubtedly it will be, and support those who are most vulnerable. So as the world takes this collective breath, more and more people are questioning what kind of world do we want to go back to? How do we identify and maximize what we really value? And what do we learn from this moment to prepare for these future challenges, health, economic and environmental? And at Julie's Bicycle, we've spent a lot of time thinking about how we can best support arts and culture to join the dots of systemic failures and build community and solidarity and keep the spotlight on global justice. And for many, this is what we are calling um, a green recovery. Or for us, we're talking about a green recovery for culture. And this approach aims to provide a coherent roadmap for environmental innovation and business re resilience, uh, creating pathways for systemic change through new collaborations, new learning and scaling what works. So this is a big challenge, yes, but it is an opportunity to build a far better world for everybody. Thank you very much. Wow, thank you very much. You you give us really a lot, a lot of very interesting information. Um, and it's very interesting because as you said yourself, you're working on this, well, Julie's Bicycle is working on this field, has been working on this field for a very long time. So you have been um, probably developing so many different um, programs and ideas. Um, so, and I'm very happy. I don't have to ask the first question because there are already <laughs> quite a few ones. So I will just pick the question first and then, um, okay, good morning. A question according the data collection. Which data should be collected in cultural institutions? Can you mention specific monitoring systems? And what about this resources, main manpower, technical power for specific data collection? Okay, good question. Um, let me just tackle resources first. So I would say, uh, thankfully, now, uh, there are so many free accessible resources, uh, guides, fact sheets that are available online that a lot of people have been developing, uh, Julie's Bicycle included. So if you're wanting to start uh, to develop your environmental approach, don't worry about recreating the wheel because a lot of the hard work has already been done. Um, there are, I'm sure there are a lot of uh, resources um, in Germany, but speaking from uh, Julie's Bicycle's perspective, we try and make as many, uh, as many of our resources freely available on our website um, as possible. So you can go on to juliesbicycle.com and find resources in energy management, waste management, biodiversity, plastics, sustainable production, uh, how to develop a policy, how to develop an action plan. There's loads. And if you want any help in identifying uh, those, you can get in touch with us directly and we will support you in finding what is appropriate. Um, in terms of what environmental impacts organizations should be looking at, 
well, that's a, a process um, that each organization needs to go on. So it will really depend on what your activities are and what is in your control and what is in your influence. So, for example, if you're a cultural um, building, a, a theater, you may be interested in your energy because you're going to be using quite a lot through heating, ventilation, air conditioning, uh, lighting for productions. So energy is very likely to be your main environmental impact and where you can actually influence change. Uh, for a touring organization, it's not going to be um, the energy of the buildings unless you own a building. It will be the travel associated with your tour. So you want to think about what your main activities are, your scope of your organization, and then what the uh, associated environmental impacts are with your activities. And then think, OK, so what can I control? What can I influence and what do I have? neither control nor influence over because if you can't do anything about it there's uh you you probably don't want to prioritize it as your first environmental impact to tackle um and then when it comes to actually uh, measuring well you can use our uh, free carbon calculator the creative green tools so any organization and can create an account on our carbon calculator uh, it's a calculator that is designed specifically for the creative industries and it allows you to put in uh, raw data whether it's kilowatt hours of energy uh, miles of travel um, amount of timber procured, uh, all different kinds of impacts. And you can put those numbers in and then it will create for you a carbon footprint um, in the data tables and graphs. Um, so I hope that's a starting point. Very good. Thank you very much. I go directly to the second question, which is how do organizations you have worked with deal with the problem of financial resources, lack of funds for such turn towards sustainability in events organization? <clears throat> yeah, um, a good question that will uh, very much likely always be a challenge to deal with. Um, I mean, there's, there's no easy, um, easy way of answering that. I would suggest, um, you know, there are the uh, what we call low hanging fruit. Um, I don't know how that trans <laughs> translates. Um, basically, the easy wins, the thing that the things that don't require uh, much investment. And they are usually about uh, behavior changes and things that um, you can do in terms of small personal actions. Um, and that actually can create um, the vast sort of proportion of environmental impact reduction is, is through behavior change. So you don't necessarily need huge amounts of money to start making improvements. And those improvements will be really supported by those internal governance structures. So having a clear commitment um, from your organization that is then reflected in job descriptions, uh, inductions, um, uh, staff roles and responsibilities, code of conduct, um, that it's really embedded in the thinking and practice of what all, um, all your colleagues are responsible for. Um, and then through the small savings, you can help create um, uh, through uh, the model I talked about before, the return on investment, if you're starting to make efficiencies through behavior change, you can try and ring fence that money to start saving for slightly uh, larger investment measures. Now, it might be that you need a larger sum of money to do something really big. Um, and I think there are increasingly, there, there is funding, uh, there is more and more funding being made uh, available for environmental interventions but you will be in a better, more competitive position to apply for that funding if you've demonstrated all these things that sort of come before it um, mm -hmm. and the performance improvements that you've been making and your commitment to environmental good practice. And certainly um, 
certainly in the UK, there is more and more cultural funding, which is recognizing environmental good practice um, as a very competitive feature of funding bids and funding applications. I think this will only improve. And I also recommend that anyone giving cultural funds, whether you're a, a cultural funder or a city government, that you include um, environmental criteria in your application process, which helps create the demand for more uh, environmental uh, programs and practices. Okay, well, this is very good um, answer because it's very, very practical uh, suggestion of what um, funders could do. Um, as there are other questions from right now, but there will be, I'm sure, <laughs> from the audience, I will like you to tell us a bit more about your international work because as we were preparing the talk, You were telling me that there are right now a lot of your your I mean obviously Joseph's bicycle is a worldwide uh, operating um, institution, but you were telling me that you are now working on new uh, program or project with um, with Euro cities with the network of the of the cities in Europe, and also as we were applying for the um, European Capital of Culture, it would be also interesting for us to know uh, what are the, um, well, yeah, what are the aspects that are taken into consideration also in the, in, from, by cities who, which maybe already have the title or are applying and because obviously also this European Capital of Culture can also be considered like a new uh, way of improving and changing own city yeah yeah absolutely um the european capital of culture program is a really exciting opportunity to be embedding um different approaches uh, that will outlast the program and create really interesting uh, legacies um so with um the collaboration with uh, euro cities is within a uh, eu horizon 2020 project called rock and rock is all about cultural heritage uh, cities um, being sites for economic social and environmental sustainability so it, it's heri heritage actually is the vector for change and Uh, something that Eurocities and Julie's Bicycle have recently launched is a guide to sustainable city events. So um, I'm happy to share uh, that guide with you, Valentina, to, to circulate no. to anyone um, interested. And that guide could be, um, I think, really useful for um, public programming activities that would happen as part of a European Capital of Culture program. Uh, we actually are, Eurocities and Julie's Bicycle, are looking at developing um, a guide for European Capital of Culture programs to embed sustainability uh, formally uh, into their processes and practices uh, from the stage of even developing uh, the proposal and the bid book. Um, we know that a lot of, for, for a, a, quite a, a long period of time, there have been European Capital of Culture programs that have done really interesting um, environmental um, projects. But as far as I'm aware, there's not a sort of a framework to help that, that thinking. Mm -hmm. So we're responding to, to that uh, gap and hopefully we'll be bringing something out in the next, uh, the next few months. But Rock is part one of our uh, sort of several city uh, international urban city programs. Uh, we also have a great program called Sea Change, which is one of, um, an EU urbact program. And Sea Change is, is really cool. It's basically taking the model that was established in Manchester um, by a, a network called Manchester Arts and Sustainability Team. And Manchester Arts and Sustainability Team, or MAST, um, basically developed in response to a city strategy and they wanted to ensure that culture were, uh, was really um, a, you know, in a position to influence and impact the city's environmental uh, targets. So MAST developed and it now works very closely with the city on its environmental strategy and has developed this really interesting model of practice And that is now um, being uh, sort of transferred, those learnings, to uh, various other cities across Europe. 
So that's another great example of, of kind of scaling a model that's been really um, successful. Uh, we've also had a great partnership with the World Cities Culture Forum, and you can uh, access some of the resources that we created in partnership um, with WCCF. Uh, they're also online on our website. We created uh, 14 city profiles, um, cities from across the world, and we uh, did a sort of SWOT analysis of where that the culture and their environmental teams were collaborating across policy and strategy, investment and creative programming, and then created these 14 city profiles, uh, which really make the case for the opportunities of cities and city government, and just what really impactful things can happen um, when you get a culture team and an environmental team to work um, in dialogue. Um, and then lastly, I'll just mention another inter, um, international program uh, that's not specific to cities, um, but it really speaks to this point of, uh, of building community and creating uh, shared practice and exchanging practice. And that's a program called Creative Climate Leadership. Um, and that's a, um, a sort of leadership development program that has happened uh, so far in Wales, um, Slovenia, uh, Arizona in the USA. And mm -hmm. yeah, it's it, it, a very <laughs> mixed. <laughs> um, and it's really bringing together a community of artists and cultural organizations. And uh, together we uh, learn um, different things from climate science and climate justice to active listening, uh, different styles of leadership and really help uh, capacity build the kind of leadership qualities of arts and culture uh, to act on sustainability. And we're really open to co-creating programs um, of creative climate leadership with in different uh, locations and with different communities. So again, if, you, if that's something you're interested in, uh, do get in touch. Mm -hmm. I think um, this this idea of um, educating the leadership it's a very interesting point to me because I mean there are two points which are I think are very interesting. The one is um, as we are at the beginning of our process, and uh, I wonder if you could tell more about. I mean, there is always this clash, or let's say, a very uh, how can I say it? A very um, careful approach to culture like to say okay culture is you know it's kind of a sex skeptical approach maybe that culture is not it's like this the last thing that comes in the row and uh, well I don't need to <laughs> to tell more about that so I wonder and obviously there is the political will there has to be a political will to use the tool of culture if you can reduce culture to a tool which is not the case but just to make the point um can you tell more about this? Because obviously it's always very difficult. I mean, unfortunately, there isn't the awareness what a powerful tool culture is. And when you were saying, we were telling more about that at the beginning, but still, we are still somehow fighting with the with the rest of the world. Mm. <laughs> and just to say culture, it's it's a main issue and it's not something you can forget. We with cultural and arts, which can really make a change. And this is a point that it's always very frustrating for people working in the cultural field that we always have to, to convince people how important we are. Can you make some, some I don't know, yeah. if you had like an example saying, okay, we went there and yeah. if you can think of something? No, I mean, uh, your you're totally correct. Uh, we always have to uh, make the case for why culture. Um, it's uh, very boring now because it's so <laughs> self evident. Yeah. Um, I would say things are changing. Um, I think that increasingly people, um, you know, have been trying to affect change through using the science and to maybe some extent policy levers. And we haven't come that far um, mm -hmm. and I think there is an increasing recognition that it really does need to come from people power and it's essential that this is um, 
you know, something that needs to be breathed into the everyday existence of every person um, on the planet. And how do you how do you do that? That's not through culture, because culture affects change in a completely different way. People respond to storytelling, to narrative. We always have. It's not, you know, the, the carbon footprint is not the sexiest. <laughs> <of change>. um, <laughs> yeah. So arts and culture are in this amazing opportunity. And I think it is being uh, increasingly uh, recognized. Our uh, founder, director, Alison Tickell, um met uh, with a, a contingent from Music Declares Emergency. So Music Declares Emergency are one of these amazing um, advocacy um, and sort of campaigns that have emerged in the past couple of years, um, sort of art form specific responses. Um, there's Music Declares Emergency, Culture Declares Emergency, Architects Declares Emergency. Um, and they're really building a huge amount of um, momentum. And uh, they met with uh, Franz Timmermans um, in the EU, in, in Brussels, to talk about uh, the Green Deal. And there was such a recognition of the um, importance of music and of culture to be able to reach people and drive change. So it is I think it is changing. Maybe it's not changing as fast as we want, but I would say uh, the important thing to do is keep advocating for culture um, in regards to sustainable development. And yes, you can advocate that through messaging and of course um, artwork, but we know that culture brings more to this than the art. Um, it's a whole ecosystem um, of practices that are responding to this environmental uh, challenge. So advocate through demonstrating. Mm -hmm. um, and we, we sort of came up with this, I guess, uh, frame to, to tell the story of the different ways that culture is responding. And we called it the seven creative climate trends, um, which is just a way of saying, you know, it, it's, not, it's not just about the art. It's not just about the art. That, that may sound like a not great thing to hear for arts and culture, but it isn't. <clears throat> and the seven trends tell the story of cultural policy and investment, of innovation in materials, of innovation in new uh, business models and uh, value models, um, collab creative collaborations, artist activism, um, the uh, impact, the environmental impact management of cultural buildings and events. Um, there's a whole ecosystem uh, that culture has that is contributing to sustainable development. And it's the sort of coherency um, of, that, of that story that I think we need to be uh, communicating to our investors and to our policymakers, because it's the whole ecosystem of culture that is changing. Mm. And too mm -hmm. often, you know, artists may get invited to conferences uh, simply to do to do uh, a piece of art, and it's like the the nice to have. Well, you know, that is very disrespectful because culture has way more to bring than than just as the communicator. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> we have a lot to do, but it's a very good. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> okay. There are three more questions. Uh, the first one is: Is there a freely accessible database for such guide guidelines, best practices you know of, or would that be through you? Yeah. Well. Yeah. Um, then I, I'll put. I'll ask all the three of them. Does Julie's bicycle fund itself solely through consulting fees, or so? If so, and the third one is. Do you see a problem with the multiplicity of coexisting approaches of organization towards sustainability? <laughs> hmm. um, okay, I'll take that the last one um, first. Uh, if I understand um, correctly, yeah. um, <clears throat> it's it's really interesting. That it's a, it's a very interesting question. I guess the multiplicity of responses is both potentially the strength and the weakness. We need a diversity of responses. <coughs> uh, we need to be testing ideas and share those learnings, even when they fail, because it's through that shared learning of failure and of success that helps um, build a more collective uh, knowledge of what good practice uh, looks like. Uh, so yes, we do. Um, I, I don't 
I think the multiplicity of responses is uh, a good thing uh, through diversity and culture and sustainability. There is a sort of a natural relationship. Um, I guess the challenge can be when perhaps um, organizations or individuals try and sort of build an approach without maybe learning from what is uh, currently happening already. Um, and as an example, I'll actually use um, one of the recommendations that we always give to cities that is, um, or funders, in fact, and that is, you know, one of the first things you should do is map what's already happening. Um, map what initiatives and projects are going on and look at the ways that they can be better supported, better connected, and that further value can be uh, can be found from what is already on the ground. I think too often we try and introduce new things into the mix without recognizing what's already there and actually focus on supporting what's already there and giving that more strength and platform. So that's my response to to that question, if I've if I've understood it correctly. Uh, resources, um, I would say, uh, obviously, I'll, I'll advocate for Julie's Bicycles Library of Resources. Um, there's a lot of materials um, online on our website that are uh, freely accessible. Um, but there there are resources that you can identify in uh, a lot a lot of different places. Um, I think the thing is to be clear what you're trying to achieve and then uh, use the power of a search engine to find it. Uh, but there is no shortage now of information um, supporting you in in uh, in following a sort of environmental um, objective. I mean, you can definitely start with Julie's Bicycle. I would say it's a, it's a good place to start because of the, the breadth of information um, that we have. And we also work with a number of other partners and we always try and share and communicate um, other resources that have been, uh, been developed. But uh, I'd say first thing, uh, think about Think about what exactly you're trying to find, um, and I'm, I'm sure it exists somewhere. Um, and then, in terms of uh, our uh, funding, um, we have uh, some grants and donations. Uh, we have a consultancy program, and I suppose we have these larger partnership uh, contracts. So, uh, Arts Council England is. <coughs> you know we're the sort of service provider for arts council england so it's not really a consultancy in the same way as as um as working individually with with organizations but um it's through arts council england it's through some of the uh, eu funded programs uh, that probably makes the largest um the largest uh, proportion of the money we receive but we are a charity so we do um, receive a small amount of donations um, and and yes we do have quite um, a developed consultancy and a certification program um, as well uh, mm -hmm. creative green is what we call our consultancy services and it includes also uh, the certification uh, program as well mm -hmm. so it's a mixed model I just shared the link just as an example uh, for everybody so that they can see. It's not the newest one, but I thought it was very interesting. It's a, a German version of the Green Mobility Guide. Um, and it's focused on uh, performing arts. But still, I think it's an example of what you can find on your uh, website. Yeah. So we have two more questions. One is... Could you explain in more detail how an environmental literacy training for cultural operation might look like and what impact this can have on the whole organization? Okay. Um, <clears throat> well, I would say firstly, when, when we're developing a sort of a, a literacy or a capacity building program, we always try to work with um, another partner uh, particularly, particularly if those programs are place-based, um, and it's they're always tailored to respond to the community that that we're trying to engage. So, as an example, um, <clears throat> we're running a, a digital program uh, right now called Accelerator, which is, is focused on 
project development. Um, creative climate leadership is really focused on leadership sort of capacities and understanding um, where you might place yourself in terms of the a sort of a whole spectrum of different leadership roles and then the kind of uh, I, I suppose how you build your own agency uh, to make change in your context uh, but we also run literacy programs that say are more based on environmental impact management so the sort of basics of um, understanding data, um, in, in making improvements in environmental performance, some of those sort of key governance uh, questions um, that I uh, uh, spoke about before. Um, but I'll maybe focus a bit more on creative climate leadership um, in terms of, of impact and the way that creative climate leadership has run uh, historically, at least, uh, though it's a model that can be adapted. Um, we always work, as I said, with local partners um, in order to make sure the content is appropriately tailored uh, to the location and to the uh, participants. Uh, it really focuses on um, uh, sort of uh, critical thinking, um, on rhetoric skills, on communicating sustainability, uh, active listening. Um, it, it's It's sort of the leadership capacities that um, culture can harness to act on climate and to advocate on climate, um, as well as including knowledge in, um, in issues like climate science and uh, climate justice and uh, cultural responses that we frame with this seven creative climate trends work, actually. And it, we, we developed it really in response to um the knowledge that there were people all over the world who were doing brilliant work uh whether in organizations or as individual artists or cultural any kind of cultural practitioner but there wasn't necessarily a shared community or or space for these people to interact and uh, form connections and form relationships and that's where the idea of, of creative climate leadership came from, was really to create a space for these people already doing amazing work. But what further value could be created with them connecting and interacting, being part of a, a common community, which is named because through the naming, it becomes real. Um, and, um, you know, there are i mean you can read the creative climate we've got a, a publicly accessible report that sort of goes through a lot of the key um, insights and um, successes of the project but i think namely it really you know it builds people's confidence um, in themselves um, and helps um, focus them on exactly what they consider their levers for for influence and in making change um yeah um i think it's probably I'll, i can share i'll share again that that public report with with you valentina because yep. it really it, it will pull out those the testimonials um the impact that it's created um yeah okay thank you very much next question is does the funding in the UK for sustainable management in arts and culture come from the Department of Alter Culture or also from other ministries such as economy or environmental or energy? Um, hmm. From a city level in the UK? Um, I... I am, mm, I'm not sure. I think there's a sort of a diversity. Um, I mean, the, the city's work that I, I mentioned uh, before, which was sort of profiling 14 cities, that includes a lot of case studies. Uh, they're not UK cities though. London is the only UK city um, which is profiled in this, in this report. But I think that piece of research um, demonstrates that there are um, sort of investment measures. It might not necessarily be, be funding, but there are different 
approaches, whether it's a, a training, uh, a training scheme, or whether it's, uh, for example, the work that's happened in Amsterdam, that came from the culture department, um, the culture department uh, hired um, a sort of environmental specialist uh, to work with its cultural organizations uh, to support different energy and environmental uh, good practices. Um, or it might be uh, cultural programs that are, or, or um, artist in residence programs um, that uh, are environmentally related and artists um, uh, do a sort of environmental project or even uh, work with the city's environmental departments, um, which is a very interesting practice as well. So there's, there's a whole diversity of ways that cities are um, sort of interacting with this proposition. Um, in London, uh, there are um, some environmental funds that artists can apply for. Um, as far as I'm aware, there's not a fund from the Environment Department that's specifically cultural. But there in London, you can see from their environmental strategy, um, their environmental strategy includes uh, cultural leadership on sustainability. And their cultural strategy includes um, environment. So those two strategies are actually speaking um, to each other. So whether it's on a strategy level or uh, a program level or a sort of investment and resource level, cities, are, cities across the world are doing all different kinds of things. The purpose of the profiles uh, that I created was to show again the multiplicity of different practices. And there is no, not yet, I think, one city that's um, the obvious leader um, because everyone's doing different things. But this is what's really cool about the project is that it shows all these different um, ideas and responses that all these cities um, can learn from. Um, and uh, whether it's about a, a capacity program or um, events or community building or even hosting resources on, for example, the um, city government's website. You know, there's a whole different, um, whole array of things that we can all learn from to improve the way that um, cities are convening these two different uh, themes. But of course, there's always room uh, for more money being available, of course. <laughs> so one more question, um, looking back, how did you get the organization and institution on board in the first place to imply sustainability within their operations? How did you manage to convince them up to the management level? Hmm. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> well, I think increasingly we have to make the case for that less because a lot of, um, I think a lot of organizations know that they sort of should be or they, they want to do something. They just don't know what it is or where to start. So I think increasingly now our um, our sort of, I don't know, influence or negotiating is helping them work out what the most meaningful way of enacting change is. And sometimes organizations work with us and they want to do something um, <clears throat> And we say, OK, that, that's great, but you really want to start here because that's going to make for a much more um, robust response that will have a, a longer, a sort of more uh, sustainable momentum than uh, just focusing on this over here. So there are always principles that we will apply to working you know, with organisations um, that, again, speak to those governance points that I made before, like having a common policy or a strategy that creates that that sh that shared framework for action or formalize it in roles and responsibilities don't let just one person do this work um, on their own as well as the rest of their other job which we do see quite a lot um, you know formalize it make sure it's resourced make sure <coughs> it's properly supported so that it becomes part of the organization's architecture that's about long-term change not just sort of small measures that do something nice for a, a period of time and then die mm -hmm. um but i would say we 
you know, when we when the Arts Council England policy started, of course, there were more organisations um, that weren't, you know, bought into the idea. It's no secret that arts and cultural organisations are under a lot of pressure and introducing um, new reporting requirements is never going to be met with a standing ovation. <laughs> so, of course, it took a while to, um, you know, to, to, to demonstrate the value of the programme. And, and that's actually, you know, why, again, the data is so important because, you know, we're, we're the recipient of public money and we are uh, requiring organisations to do something. So we have to ensure that what we're doing is evidenced in value to the sector and that's why the data informs such a um, an important you know it's the it's the uh, the backbone of the program because it, it shows what what works and increasingly over time you know we can see an increase in how organizations you know are, are responding to it and that there is um an acknowledgement and increasingly, you know, organisations don't, uh, you know, they're they're doing things in their own own right. They they go far beyond the requirements of the program. Um, and again, you know, when I was saying before, it's it's not just about the carbon impacts. It's about the changing um, attitudes. So, as um, an example, if I can just bring. Um, you know, we 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 ask um, we do a qualitative survey um, each each year to understand the benefits uh, to organisations that allows us to then report on those. So, for example, in the last report, we were able to communicate that eighty one percent reported improved team morale. So this is a really interesting statistic. And actually, mm -hmm. the team, team morale and team well-being has gone up year on year um, every time that we've done this survey. So it's showing that people respond positively to knowing that their organizations are, uh, you know, being accountable for their environmental impact. It makes them feel more positive about the places that they work. 66% are reporting financial benefits. Um, so again, this is about the business case for action, uh, particularly when you're talking to funders and investors and policymakers, you know, they're going to care about the finances. So being able to talk about efficiency and money saved and sector resilience is really important. And also, we had 50 percent reporting reputational benefits. So again, that's an example of using um, your environmental policies and your action plans, your good practices, your storytelling and your communications to improve um, audience relationships, to um, to to uh, in, in improve reputation, uh, which of course then can translate into uh, more ticket sales or, um, you know, improved, um, improved uptake of your cultural products. Mm. Yeah, that's um, so now I would like to because we are, as I told you before, um, we are studying the process right now. And the, the our pro our uh, goal as a um, cultural department of the city of Dresden is really to try and start this process with the cultural scene in Dresden, which is not just the institutions, but it's also the grassrooters, everybody. And we are starting, our idea was already what you were saying, it was to take, to put together on the one side, the expert on sustainability, on environmental sustainability with our, um, with our cultural um, scene. And um, we tried in a very, very brief and not particularly scientific way to, to do this mapping, really to see. And we realized that there are different um, level of, of uh, um, knowledge within the different institutions. Obviously, we started with our uh, with our uh, municipal institutions. Um, and now we are we want to go on with this process. But obviously, one 
as you said, as we are in the crisis right now, it's also diff difficult to uh, to make clear that we have, as we are restarting, how, how do you call it? In, uh, I don't remember your... Recovering, the green recovery. Yes, yeah. yes, a green recovery. I think it's a very... Do you have any... I mean, now I'm using your consult consultants, which I didn't pay for, maybe. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> no, I'm just making fun. Um, do you have any I mean, any idea? Because what we, we think of doing is really to create... Uh, among all the institutions, where we don't want to focus just on one institution, we want to focus on the whole um, artistic world in Dresden and, and, and cultural scene. And so what would be your suggestion to start in a positive way and not to have the impression, okay, we're just giving some more, you know, th there are already difficulties and we are giving one more, um, uh, we have, we give them something more to do, which is not on their agenda right now. Yeah, sure. Um, so I would say start with, um, you know, don't start with something punitive, um, like a, a policy. <laughs> um, start with um, providing the opportunities. So knowing what organizations you know, would find beneficial right now, whether it's uh, resources, um, whether it's training, whether it's support in understanding impacts or creating a policy, you know, find out what people would find useful to the way that their organization is functioning and respond to that demand first. Uh, celebrate what's happening. So again, that, that point about you know, the, the survey, which you're already doing, you know, sharing the good practices and celebrating those good practices is uh, a great way to um, engage and to promote sort of interest in in developing further and for others to maybe learn from um, and make the case for the connection between coronavirus and climate crisis, because there are uh, parallels here. Uh, we're talking about crises, whether it's health, whether it's economic, uh, whether it's social justice, whether it's environmental. So we do need to be taking a interdisciplinary approach and a holistic approach to meeting these 21st century challenges because they're, they're not going away. Um, far from it, it's quite the opposite. So, um, you know, we can, yes, we're in this um, this particular moment of time now. And of course, a lot of organizations are just focused on keeping afloat, keeping in business. And they have to be allowed to prioritize that. So I think, how do we ensure resilience? This is why I think resilience is such a useful uh, frame of reference because it speaks to environmental action. It speaks to uh, business sustainability as well. Uh, green recovery for culture is a way of um, improving the sector resilience through socially and environmentally positive um, acts and actions. So I think it's sort of making the, making the case for the connection and then firstly demonstrating what support can be offered uh, to organizations to get them sort of on the right track to build understanding. And, you know, then you can sort of take a staggered approach and perhaps in time, you know, something around um, environmental responsibility starts becoming a priority uh, within funding or policy and eventually perhaps becomes a requirement. But it's about taking organizations on a journey uh, with you um, and um, I think you know the 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 stage the first stage to focus on is, is about empowering and engaging and and educating. Mm, yeah, yeah. Thank you. And one more question concerning this is yeah, there is also so wish for empowerment again. This is one of the comments uh, of uh, someone in our audience. Um, and what about solidarity? Because you were saying what we really have to work on solidarity and not on competition. Mm which is also something that concerns me a lot because I think it's very hard to, um, well, obviously also because the resources are not so big in the cultural um, area. There is always, instead of thinking we work together on the whole, we, they, they, sometimes every now and again, it comes out that uh, they're just competing with each other for, uh, 
for whatever and and how do you manage to increase this idea of solidarity yeah um well i i, I mean i guess i from my own perspective most of the work i do is with is with the public funded cultural sector uh, though we do have commercial clients for sure as well and it's really interesting to see sometimes the differences in the way that you know a very commercial art form say music can be very different to a public funded uh, gallery or museum um in sort of different ways both you know sort of uh, different levers for for influence and different ways of working in my experience mostly environmental sustainability provides a common platform to collaborate rather than to compete because it's in everyone's best interests you know it's to the value of no one if we compete over you know the best ways to do something sustainability related yeah. you know there's no value to be gained there really um and everybody wins through working together because you know we're all kind of you know on a journey um nobody has nailed this that's why we're in the situation that we're in so creating these these spaces for understanding that we're bigger than the sum of our parts and it's through shared learning and through collaboration that we actually succeed um and it's really i think sort of collaboration is one of the values of the creative climate uh, leadership that that network that i talked about before because the whole value is in the community you know it, it's not about individuals it's a community response and what um action and what sort of value and impact can be leveraged through uh, collaboration so maybe it helps to just make the the case um, you know, for that. So the example that I was uh, discussing before about Manchester Arts and Sustainability Team, you know, they were in a position to influence city policy because they collaborated, because they were a multitude of different organisations, um, some public funded, um, some commercial, um, or, or, or at least a mix of those two. Uh, and working across art form, what they had in common was the city of Manchester. Um, and wanting to make change in the city that they loved. And from being a, uh, a network in their own right, they are now one of the uh, seven pioneer sectors of the city's environmental and climate strategy. So they've sort of moved from being slightly outside what the city was doing in terms of climate to now being one of the pioneer sectors and MAST uh, culture is the pioneer sector and MAST is the sort of driving force. Um, so from that experience of collaborating, and then there's an, a further scaling up to that through the Sea Change Project, where they're sharing that model with other cities across Europe. So it's a great example of the value built through a collaboration, influencing bigger change, and then scaling that change to other areas to promote the same impact. So mm. we do work better um, through sharing. And maybe, you know, if, if there's a feeling of sort of ret reticence towards that, it's just about demonstrating, you know, all the examples uh, that, that, that prove that point. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I have one last question. And then, I don't know, in the meanwhile, can maybe people in the audience uh, think if they have more questions? Um, because what your, your work is really focusing on um, on environmental um, sustainability, but we have realized we had also examples in the last two days of uh, more these sustainable goals of the UN, like the 17 uh, SGs uh, of the UN. So there are there is a layer of uh, other uh, goals dealing with sustainability that are. I mean, you were talking about uh, social justice, which is also a further one um so i mean your priority is definitely and i understand that but what can you say more also about the the the, the other goals that obviously each one has to choose for itself herself it's his self mm. itself as an organization yeah um yes a uh, great question um so you know there are a, a number of different um 
sort of policy uh, frameworks that are enabling change. The sustainable the sustainable development goals is is you know definitely um, one of the the main ones. Um, but I think people need to remember when they're using the SDG framework that it, it is climate action that underpins the success of all of them. So very frequently. Um, I see people using the SDGs and saying, OK, so I'm picking three and boom, it's sustainable. And it's usually economic growth and and then two other ones um, and very rarely climate change and then talking about sustainability. So the SDGs can be a really useful framework in terms of understanding the interdisciplinary uh, nature of sustainability and social change. Definitely. Um, however, it also is a framework that people can quite easily um, sort of tailor to their specific interests and overlook things that are really critical. So in the in the UN narrative around the SDGs, you know, it, when it talks about climate action, it's saying this goal is underpinning the success of all of them. We we can do so much. Um, but if it's not you know, uh, underpinned with climate, it doesn't have the the resilience. Uh, but that said, climate action that doesn't account for other issues like race and gender is not good climate action. Because, uh, and this is why the climate justice uh, frame is really, is really useful, because we are not going to succeed in our climate targets without some uh, socio-economic um, uh, changes to the way that the whole sort of global world, the globe functions, uh, we're not going to be able to deliver. And that is very much about social social justice and the functioning of the economy. Uh, so use the SDGs to, to sort of understand um, how these different issues, you know, interact. But remember, it, it's not just about picking goals in isolation. It's about sort of understanding that uh, tapestry of interconnections. Um, so for us, when we now talk about environmental action, for us, that's really underpinned by social justice, because the two, you know, they, they don't exist outside of each other. Um, one cannot be achieved without the other. Thank you. Okay, there are more questions. Um, what could be my contribution getting an institution to imply more sustainability. I myself work at the music as, as a musician at the music sorry at the music school as a teacher, so I don't have any managing function in this institution. Okay, um, well, maybe a way uh, to start would be engaging the students instead. Um, if you're a teacher and working with the students. Um, what interests do they have? Is there an opportunity to create a sort of uh, student-led environmental movement within your institution? Um, or if that's uh, <laughs> potentially too problematic, then I would just say, um, you know, talk to um, talk to people in the organisation. Find out if there is an interest. There, there might be a, a developing interest that's just not found a place to, to manifest yet. And they might be waiting uh, for somebody to, to ask and speak out and uh, help sort of galvanise change. But if it feels like there is sort of reticence from the, um, I don't know, the management, then maybe it's, it's sort of... Um, through the students and is there a, um, a sort of a student movement that, that could start that would um, I guess put a, a little more pressure on seeing a response from from management um, I think you know it, it's through it's through the movements like you know whether you love them or not but it's through the school strikes um, extinction rebellion you know, these movements um, are affecting change. They are driving change on a political level. So you've got to think about what your levers of influence are and how to try and attract support um, for those. Maybe it's about sharing um, an article of a similar establishment that's done something. I know there are music schools in the UK and uh, um, 
sustainable production colleges that have been embedding sustainability in their um, in their teaching uh, for a number of years now. Um, so it's you know when we talked about competition and collaboration, well. It is a very useful way of showing, you know, what other people are doing to inspire um, some interest in the issue. You know, um, I think increasingly students are going to want to are going to be more drawn to institutions that care about this issue. You know, there are all kinds of student surveys now. I've seen one certainly about universities demonstrating that students want to see evidence that their universities are acting on their environmental impacts and driving change. It's actually becoming a driver in where people want to go to school. So use that, use that intelligence, use that information and see what other people are doing and try and use that to prompt maybe your colleagues uh, to think about how um, an approach could be developed uh, wherever you are. Thank you. Now we have a big question. Oh God. Okay. <laughs> what do you think about culture as an extra goal of the SDGs? Um, well, I know obviously there's been uh, great work um, from the likes of um, UCLG, United Cities and Local Government, who've been advocating for a number of years as uh, culture as the fourth pillar of sustainable development. Um, I mean, it is. The thing is, these culture is implicit in all of the approaches to the SDGs. So, sure, you could have um, social, economic, environmental, and cultural um, sort of pillars of sustainable development. It's without a doubt um, the case that culture is a pillar of sustainable development, whether it's explicit within the SDG framework or not. I guess the, the the benefit of it being explicitly a pillar mm. of sustainable development is that it offers a major um, advocacy opportunity for culture and it would probably, I imagine, um, encourage um, greater engagement uh, from the cultural sector in, in terms of uh, other um, sustainable development issues. But it's still only sort of one part of the discussion because, yes, the SDGs are certainly a powerful force um, for ad advocacy and have definitely led to a lot of positive change but they are also very open to interpretation and people doing all kinds of things that don't necessarily actually achieve greater sustainability so mm -hmm. uh, yes I think uh, definitely it should be I think it would be a really important move um, for culture and recognizing the agency of culture but it's also sort of one part of the equation and i think you know the sdg narrative you know it still needs to be about decisive um climate action and a social transition um and an economic transition to sustainability that is to the value of all and culture obviously is an amazing um sort of conduit for that and offers a huge amount of practic practical um, solutions and ideas to help make that transition. So, you know, yes, but, um, or yes, and more than needs to happen as well. Okay. Well, that sounds like a very good final statement from you <laughs> and for us as well. Um, if there aren't any more questions, which I don't think it's the case. Um, okay, so I would like to thank you really very, very, very much. Oh, yes, I oh, know. Okay, they're already thanking you. Okay. <laughs> you're, you're very welcome. Um, it was really inspiring. I think as we are going to record this, uh, we will really need to hear again of all the information, all pieces of information you gave to us. And um, yeah, I think uh, we have a lot to do, but your work shows that we are on a good way. And uh, that is really important to work together and uh, really as a, yeah, uh, this, this as a cooperative group and not as a com com competition group. So I think this idea of solidarity is also one of the most important issues um, 
to carry on in order to achieve some results. Okay, so thank you a lot. Ah, no, one more question. Okay, okay, okay. I hope it's an easy one. <clears throat> Is there a discussion about freedom of art and sustainability? Is there a discussion about freedom for art and sustainability? Um, I'm sure there is. Um, I, I, I can't pretend that I am an expert um, on that subject, but um, I suppose it, it, it depends exactly. Um, are we talking about sort of the movement of artists or the artistic expression um, of artists and how that relates to sustainability? Um, I think there is a, certainly a lot of provocative um, and controversial art on sustainable uh, sustainability themes and that should be uh, actively encouraged because something that culture um, and art and artists offer here is a critique and actually it's, it's through critique I believe that actually we can start to make some some really meaningful change because um, there is a, <laughs> there's a lot to be critical um, about, and we need to be finding uh, the spaces and the places uh, to uh, have those discussions. And artists and creative uh, practitioners are brilliant facilitators of challenging uh, discussions and creation of safe spaces. So I believe that that's an, a really important role for arts and culture. Okay. So, and there is also one point that I, well, no, it's not a question, it's just an invitation, though I think everybody would be very happy to have you in Dresden sometime. So we will work on that when you're, well, we must say we wanted to have you here as a person, not just as a digital <laughs> person, but hopefully there will be a possibility in the future to meet personally yes. and further discuss. I would love thank to. Thank you very much. much. <laughs> Have a nice okay. day. And, thank you. Uh, go on with your great work. Thank okay. you, Valentina. Thank you, very thank much. you everyone. Bye bye. Bye. -bye.